really cool things that Jesus says, but I can't figure out how they all fit together. Turns out, 2,000 years ago, when Jesus was around preaching, they called preaching, and it was literally, it, the, the words meant this, stringing pearls. Because the way that a teacher would teach is to give you a pearl of wisdom that you can memorize and take with you. And so today we have a whole string of pearls that, uh, that we're going to pick out some things that Jesus is trying to tell us as we pick through the, the chapter that we have today. We're actually starting chapter 12 in the Gospel according to Luke. And today is our anniversary, right? We've been in Luke for a whole year. So happy anniversary. <laughs> so we've been taking it one story at a time, which ends up being about uh, one chapter a month. That's why we're here now. We look at it with the, the background and the culture so that we understand more about these words than just the English words on a page. I love that part. Now, where we're at, Jesus has been leading a populist movement with everyday regular folk. These are, this is a, these are regular everyday people, not the people who are the leaders. They are, they are regular people. The leaders are the Pharisees and people like them. There aren't that many of them. But Jesus has chosen them for ridicule. Now, to me, if I, used, if I looked at it in today's light, I would think that sounds like, uh, like a late show comedy, right? You get to pick on the leaders, right? You get to say funny things about the people who are in power. 2,000 years ago, you really didn't do that because they had power and they would use it on you. <laughs> and so when Jesus is doing this, it's really a counterculture strike to, uh, to ridicule the people who are the leaders in the, the Jewish community. And the reason why he did it is because they thought they were so much better than everybody else because uh, they, they, their form was amazing, but they valued form over function. And so what was happening with these guys is that, uh, uh, that the Pharisees would follow the 613 laws of Moses and they would do it in such a painful way, nobody else could follow them, so they looked like they were that much better than everybody else, but they didn't do it with the right heart, and so they left certain things out. Jesus has a problem with that. He starts his ministry off in Galilee, which is way north in Israel, and he gets quite a following up there. And when he leaves there with his following, he takes all of his best disciples and they come south into Judea, which is where the only metropolitan area Jerusalem is 2,000 years ago. They come down and now he begins to teach all these new people and he tells his disciples, I want you to go practice. Go, go practice on these people who haven't heard our message. It's going to be great. Glad that you are here. Go bless these people with what I have taught you. You go teach them. And so that's what they did. Now, we are in chapter 12 today, and we start off like this. So the crowds in, in Galilee got so big that Luke calls them crushing. Today, we see in, now in Judea, these crowds have gotten so big, it sounds like this. Meanwhile, when the crowds of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling one another, that sounds like a big crowd, right? Jesus began to speak first to his disciples. These are the people that came down with him. These are the people that are following him, not just the 12, but probably a whole lot more than that. Jesus begins to speak first to the disciples, saying, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now, most of you probably have heard of yeast, but maybe don't know what we're talking about today. Now, these crowds knew what they were talking about for many reasons. Uh, and, and the reason is this. They were more connected with that culture. Now, uh, I, if, how many of you bake your own bread? Like all eight of you. Okay, yeah. The, the thing about bread is, let me tell you how you do that. Although I've never actually done it. Uh, this is my job. I get to tell people how this works. Yeast... You go down to Safeway and you buy it in a package, right? And then you pour it into your dough and your dough rises. Now, what you're actually doing is you're taking a microorganism that is in the fungus family <laughs> and pouring it into your food. 
Then you mix it up in there, and then you wait for it to work. And you know what it does? It grows. It grows in there, and then your bread begins to rise, and then it becomes the, the tasty treat that bread really is. So it's my favorite food group. I love bread. So, but that rising of the bread, that's something that happens naturally when the yeast is activated and it grows. Well, it's actually a natural process. 2,000 years ago, they did not have small packages of yeast, and it didn't come from Safeway. It was natural. It took a lot longer for it to happen, but that yeast would, would begin to grow in the bread and start eating the sugars in there, and, and it would begin to... Uh, uh, to, to grow, and the way that you would have bread that would rise tomorrow with the yeast is you would take your bread, uh, your dough that you're making your bread with, cut a piece of it off and save it because you're going to save the active bioorganism in it. You would bake the other bread, killing all of the really good things that you didn't know that was like murder when you cooked your bread, but it is. And then you'd take your bread and eat it, but then you'd have some left over. You'd make some more dough, but you'd mix in the old dough so that, it got, so that that yeast got into it. And the thing about yeast is, once you have it, it sticks with you. It doesn't go away. It's actually pretty hard to give, to give up and to get away from it. Jesus says the Pharisees are a lot like yeast. They begin to spread throughout anything that, uh, that, it, is, uh, that it is given to they follow the 613 laws of Moses, but they do it with form over function, and they did it in such a painful way so that everybody around them could see just how awesome they really are because of how awesome they have followed these rules, but they have no, re they have no idea why those rules are there to begin with. The spirit of the law was not important, only the letter. So they actually figured out ways to cheat so that they could follow the letter of the law and not the, the spirit of the law. And our point number one today is be careful who you follow. Because if you follow the Pharisees, you're going to start doing what the Pharisees do. And if you do that, it will infect everything that you do. And you will no longer be following the way of God, doing the things that look very similar to God-like things. These are people who wanted to be seen as faithful but aren't because of their heart. Woe to you experts in the law. These are the lawyers, sometimes called scribes. These are the lawyers that taught them how to get around all the things that all the regular everyday people had to do. Woe to you experts in the law because you have taken away the key to knowledge. You yourself have not entered and you have hindered those who were entering. So, these lawyers who know all the law are not actually a part of the kingdom of God as far as Jesus is concerned. He says, you're here, but you're not part of the kingdom, and you can't take anybody anywhere you haven't already been. So, if you're following one of these lawyers, you're not going to get to the kingdom of heaven, even though they know everything, because they're not there. You ever tried giving directions to a place you've never been before? It's tough, right? And I see, I see people who say they love Jesus try to give directions to the kingdom of God, and yet I'm not sure they've actually been there yet. It's tough. So these guys hold the keys to the kingdom of God, but they haven't actually gone inside themselves. They can't help anyone else do that. Now, the best illustration I've got for that is uh, in the Middle Ages, the, uh, the, the church... It's the Catholic Church, but that was the only church they, they really had uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, in, uh, at least in the West. They began to teach in church in Latin because God speaks Latin best. I know, it's not true. It, English is his first language. But, <laughs> but they taught in Latin because only the educated knew Latin and they only wanted to teach the educated. They want to keep everybody else dumb. So the last thing we want you to, to do, if you are dumb, we don't want to teach you so that you know what I know. I want you to stay dumb, and I want you to do what I tell you to do. And that's the way they did it. So they could make up all kinds of stuff because they couldn't read Scripture because it was all in Latin. 
Now, that's what these guys were doing 2,000 years ago. They weren't teaching people how to think for themselves. They said, just do what I have told you to do. Now, these are the people who are in charge. They can make your life miserable if you don't do what they tell you to do. But Jesus tells you this. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. Death seems kind of like a lot to worry about, right? He says, you shouldn't worry about people that can only kill you. (laughs) But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after your body has been killed, has the authority to throw you into hell. It's about time we got around to some hell talk around here, right? I love that part. You're like, why are you, you're really worried about the people who have the authority to kill you? You should be worried about the one who judges eternity. That sounds like more smart, right? Let's do the more smart thing. Work on that. I he said, yes, I tell you, fear him. I love that part. He says, you know, I understand there are things in this world that are going to be difficult. And you should, you should totally see that as something that's worth doing because if you always take the easy road, you get to the end, you're going to get to spend eternity somewhere. Why don't we live our life in the kingdom of God? And whatever happens between now and then, it's going to be just fine because we'll have eternity then. It's easy for me to say, right? I, I live in... In the USA, we stopped killing Christians a long time ago, right? But I understand this, that I live in a town where there are many industries here in Chico that if you are vocal about your faith, that it can be bad for your job. There are many places in Chico that are like that. And the thing about it is this. I don't get to choose whether or not I am vocal about my Christianity. Not I, I get paid to tell everybody, hey, I follow Jesus. And I think you should too. Now, I made two statements there, right? The first one is, I follow Jesus. That's an I statement. We can all make I statements. If you're a follower of Jesus, it's easy to say that. And you never get in trouble for I statements, usually. Maybe never. The ones we get in trouble for in our everyday lives is the you statements. You know what you ought to do? Always, always a bad way to start a conversation, right? So we're talking about I statements today. Now, I want to tell you about this. What Christianity teaches, what Jesus wants you to know is that your faith should bring some friction to your life. Things should heat up a little bit. Things should should not be really smooth in your life if you are serving Jesus. He says there's always going to be friction somewhere. Uh, This is my friend, um, an acquaintance. I like him. I like him to be my friend. Uh, Bill Such, he's actually... Try that again. This is my friend Bill. He is the former director of the, uh, uh, of the uh, Jesus Center. Jesus Center does amazing work here in Chico. They serve uh, two meals six days a week for people who are hungry. Anyone who's hungry can go eat there. They serve hundreds of meals a day. They have a place, if you don't have any other place to get mail, you can get mail there. If uh, you need a shower, you can get a shower there. They have a, uh, uh, an emergency shelter for women. They, uh, they do real social work there. They do really good stuff here in Chico. And, um, and they, they, oh, they have a, a very professional office and they do a very good job. Uh, Bill has been the director there for 10 years. And, uh, and this fall... He, is, uh, he has been a part of the conversation about homelessness here in Chico. And I got to tell you, um, we, we got, there's an issue here in Chico with homelessness. There are lots of people here that live outside. Uh, and if you go downtown, uh, you know, we got this great plaza that 
mean, if you want to find people who live outside, you, you can go find them there uh, downtown. Uh, there are places downtown that smell like somebody turned over a porta potty, right? It's horrible. And we, we need to do something about it. There are people who are, who are camping out in, the, uh, in Lindo Channel and out in the park. There are people all over our community that, that need shelter. They need some, some help. Not all of them want help. And we have a real issue here in Chico. Bill said, as the executive director of the Jesus Center, if you're having trouble with some of these people downtown, if you let us know, we'll help do the discipline. They said, we can do that in a loving, Christ-like manner. We can, we can love these people. If you will let us, we'll, we'll totally do that. And he's been working with the city council. A lot of people have said, well, the problem is, is that it's easy to be homeless in Chico because of places like the Jesus Center. If we can just shut those down, then we wouldn't have homeless people here. Right? It's like, uh, okay. Um, and, and I don't... I'm going to come as close as I can to not making a, a, a public statement about public policy. But uh, what, uh, what the city of Chico did is they said, we got to do something about this. So the city council passed what is called a, an enhanced sit-lie policy. What they have said is if anyone spreads out their stuff, that they can be arrested for that. So it's a good tool. You get to move people along. You say, you need to pick up your stuff and keep moving. Because you can't be here. It's not illegal to be homeless. It, it almost is. You just can't put it, you can't stop. So, uh, and, and so they've used this to do good things like clean out the Lindo Channel. And uh, instead of people camping in there and building these uh, ramshackled houses in there, uh, they've, uh, they've, they've cleared that out and, and moved some people on. And you know what? Those, those are good things. But what has happened is, is that we have taken people who are living outside for one reason or another and given the police the charge to go arrest them uh, for, 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 for living outside, for having stuff outside of you know, their, their body, then we're going to take them down to Oroville, process them, and fine them because they obviously have money for that. And then we're going to... Uh, to process them into jail, but, but there's no beds there for them, so we're going to release them. So brilliantly, instead of Chico buying bus tickets for all of our homeless people out of town, we drive them out of town in police cars and then leave them in Oroville. By the way, Oroville's not real happy about that part, because <laughs> it's working, right? <laughs> now... Uh, when they're, t when they're having this discussion, uh, Bill Such was there with his executive board, who for the most part are there to do fundraising and stuff like that, they're to help keep the place running, so they've got a really important job to do. And Bill says, There's, this is a moral outrage. Somebody needs to stand up and say that this is not the way that we value people, the way that you help people, the way that you invest in people. This is not how this works. And somebody needs to say there is a better answer. And the, the executive board of the Jesus Center, they said, um, Bill, um, we don't really know how we feel about it. Bill said, I'll tell you how to feel about it. You ever met Bill? You'll know. I don't, know, I don't know exactly how that conversation went, but it probably went something like that. So uh, they said, no, we don't know how to feel about it because the people who give money here haven't told us how to feel about it. So we're going to table it for now, lick our fingers, stick it in the air, and find out what we think. And Bill says, I've got something inside of me that's better than that, that knows. And they said, you work for us, and we will make a statement as the Jesus Center so you don't make one for us. And Bill left there, I'm sure, dialing the phone <laughs> to make a statement about it because he knows you guys can fire me, but I serve the kingdom of God.
So regardless of how you feel about that, I love that. That it isn't about my job. You know what I was doing when I found this job? Yeah. (laughs) It isn't about that. It has to be about the kingdom. And we need to live even in places that where Jesus is in the name of the title. Sometimes there's friction. And there might be friction in your job. But the thing is, is that I don't have the right, I don't have the obligation, I don't, I don't have a leg to stand on in the kingdom of God unless I am public about who I am. I want you to hear this. I tell you, whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge... I will, uh, the Son of Man will also acknowledge... That's how he talks about himself. He goes, I will publicly acknowledge you before the angels of God. This is his way of saying in front of God without calling on God's name. But whoever disowns me before others will be disowned before the angels of God. He says, if you stand up for me, I'll stand up for you. We talk about salvation being simple, and it is. The Bible says that it is a free gift of God. He gives it to us because we can't give it to ourselves. Salvation is something that, that has been earned through the cross. Jesus came and died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin. I become part of the kingdom of God by accepting Him as my Savior. But there are a few stipulations that seem to go along with this one. And one of them is, you can't stay silent. This cannot be something that you keep to yourself, because your faith cannot be private, if it is any faith at all. Your public confession is important. We say yes to Jesus as Lord. He's, he, is our, he is our Savior. He saves us because I can't save myself. He is my King because I am now a part of His kingdom. And I learn to do what the King tells me to do. But He's also my friend. He's going to show me my world through His eyes. This is a beautiful place to be. But my public confession is imperative because I need to live this out loud. This does not mean that you're going to go to work on Monday and turn up Caleb in your cubicle. Okay? You're not there to annoy everyone else. Because they do that at my work. It's horrible. A lot of commercials. Okay, I'm just kidding. Kimmy just plays Christmas music really loud. All year long. But you must tell people with your lips about whose you are and who you're trying to become. We come in here on the weekends and we practice being God's people. We use our best language and we smile our best and we try to treat people with the respect that Jesus would like us to. You're supposed to take that practice and go live it out there. And when you don't achieve that where you work, you should say, I apologize for my behavior. This is not who God is trying to make me become. And I'm still a work in progress. Please forgive me. Because that's an I statement. And we don't get in trouble for I statements. Right? This is out of Romans. Paul says this, and he wants, to, he wants the church to understand. He says this. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Remember, Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. So God justly makes you a part of his kingdom by his own declaration, by your faith. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Two parts of that. God does something in us through our belief when we understand the basics. Jesus is the Son of God. 
He died on a cross to pay the penalty for my sin. And if I accept Him as my Savior, I'm a part of His kingdom. If you understand that and you accept that, you are a part of His kingdom. But that does not mean you get to keep it to yourself. You need to make a public statement about that. When Paul says, you need to declare that Jesus is Lord, this is a big deal. This is not just like something simple. Oh, Jesus is Lord. That's really easy for us to say. 2,000 years ago, there was something called an imperial cult. Now, these are the people of, uh, with the Romans, and if you wanted to be part of the end crowd, you worshipped the Roman emperor as a gift from heaven. He, whoever the emperor was, was to be worshipped and, and, uh, and, and prayed to. Now, what they would say is, Caesar is Lord, which means that he's in charge of everything. He's the one who gives us all the good stuff. He's the guy that, that saves us. He saves all of us. When Paul says it, he says, not Caesar, but Jesus. Not your king, but my king. What he's, that's a counterculture statement. It, it, the thing about the Romans is they didn't shy away from killing people they disagreed with. Right? I will not be put on trial here for the things that I say in regard to Jesus. Some of the other stuff might be suspect. But the Jesus stuff, I'm not going to be put on trial for, right? Well, 2,000 years ago, it could happen. He says, you need to be public and you need to take a risk with everything you are. This is not a safe statement at all. This is not reposting something on Facebook, right? It's not having some kind of a crazy, arg- you know, oh, S- Starbucks took Christmas out of Christmas. Who cares? a corporation who do you serve right about you about how you're living this life out do something that's not safe okay last week i told you that uh when i had my whole family went on vacation and i ran a half marathon (laughs) what are you laughing at I have, I have a t-shirt that says half marathon on it. I ran 5K, but, well, I ran, ran and walked 5 I, I participated. We all did it, the whole family, we, we did it together. It was great. And, uh, and, I, uh, and it was such a great experience because I, I love pain. That, I, that the whole family said, let's do the run for food. You know, there's a few years ago, I thought I could, I could be a good runner, and I was learning to be, uh, yeah, so I, I learned it. The problem, I'm not a good runner. Running is a mental game. That's what I've discovered. I mean, I'm not built for speed, but, you know, it's putting one foot in front of another. It's not that difficult, but it's a mental thing. And what I've learned is that I am a mental midget when it comes to this. Because I want to stop all the time. I've got really good reasons why I should stop running. Mainly because stuff hurts, which is a good reason. But, I don't, you know, running is not my, my thing. But in order for me to figure out how to do this, because what I used to do is I used to, you know, put on some shoes, go outside and run. But I'm not, you know, I'll run for a while. And I'm like, oh, I'm tired. I'll walk for a while. Then I'll run for a while. Then I'll walk for a while. Well, what am I doing? How am I getting there? There's no way to measure this. So you know what I did? I downloaded, there's like a bunch of apps on your phone, you know, the same way that you looked for the East Ave Church app on your phone. When you, got, when you downloaded that on your phone, you can go on that same place, wherever that is, and you can type couch to 5K. So you can go from sitting on your couch to running a 5K with this app, and it's great. It's like nine weeks. And the way it works is you start out on the app, and it says, do a five-minute brisk walk to warm up. So, you know, you do that. And then, it, then, like week one is, run for one minute, walk for two. And so it tells you. It times it all for you. Walk. Run. 
walk, run. Good job. Yes. Right? And then it kind of it kind of it kind of takes you and stretches it out a little bit, and pretty soon, you know, you're you're running for five minutes and walking for three, and then walk and then running for for eight minutes. Because I need somebody to tell me what to do because I don't do that very well. It's a real hole in my. Pro- I have a problem with this, and, and I realize it, and I really like to to be good at this. So you know, I want to do this. And one of the things that I know that I do that I probably shouldn't do is that when I run. In the background, I'm listening to an audio book because, you know, I do that. I, yeah, I'm not doing anything else. Uh, but, you know, I know that real, real runners, they, they listen to music, right? So I said, I'm going to be a real runner for this. So I went and got my favorite pre- playlist, and I went and looked for all the songs that looked like it had the right beat to it so you can kind of run to the beat, Right? It's going to be amazing. I put, so I put this thing together, and it was like, you know, I wanted it to be, you know, I figured, you know, I'm, it's going to be, you know, I, I don't know, I, I figured it, I, I wanted to finish in like 30 minutes. That was, my, that was my goal, and then so I wanted to, you know, kind of, so I gave myself a little extra time on, on the music, and then uh, I put some cool down music in it, so I thought, this is going to be great. I'm going to totally do this. So I want to be a good runner, but I'm, I'm not yet, but I want to be, but I want to do the things that runners do. And, I, it, I, and runners all do that. I don't, I don't really have a clue. So, so we got together, the whole family came together, and we said, we're going to do this, walk, run, sit, jog, swim, whatever we're going to do. We're going to do this all together. And so uh, we did that, which is, uh, which is amazing. I don't know if you've ever done the, the run for food. Um, it is a kajillion people downtown in the park, down at, at, down at, uh, at one mile, and there are these little bitty lanes. And see, when, when I was on vacation, we did our, our 5K, we had this whole road all blocked off. It was a whole big road, but there were hundreds of people running on it. And now we've got these little bitty lanes, and there are thousands of people. It's weird. So, got all of these people in my way, <laughs> right? So, we're running. This is from the, uh, the Chico ER. You know, they take a bunch of pictures, and then they, they put them on the ER, uh, the website, so that, you know, and say, uh, you can buy these pictures. So, yeah, uh, so I stole them. Um, <laughs> I'm like, who doesn't know how to screen capture? Come on. Uh, but we're, we're actually running this thing, and, I, you know, this is... This, this is my son-in-law, Logan. He's, uh, he's running, and uh, he looks really good. And I can tell he's at the beginning because, um, I mean, he looks, looks pretty good. But also, um, this, this is my daughter, Kelsey, running right behind him. And, uh, you know, she had an asthma attack at some point in this and was not behind Logan <laughs> after that. So, but uh, we're running. But the thing is, is that you've got people who are there to run, and you have people that are there to walk, and then you've got people like, this with a turkey on her head. All these people are just, you know, the thing that what I learned is that this is a social event, okay? People go to have, have fun and just participate. And, and then there are some guys that I, I'm like, are you, are you kidding me, right? Here's a man obviously dressed as an athlete, like he's coming to, to watch the event, and he's got his GoPro on a pole, and so he's walking around. I'm like, yeah, you're the kind of people that I keep running into. Get off of that. But um, I, had, I had a secret weapon. So this is why I took your picture, Matt. So this, this is Matt. I don't know if you know Matt Meninga. He's, uh, he's, a, he's an amazing dude. He, um, what I know about him is, uh, is he's an athlete, aging though he is. Um, he... <laughs> But he's a lot younger than a lot younger than me, more handsome and taller. And uh, he, you know, I know that he, he had an injury. But when you run, you run like six miles a day because you don't know when to stop, which I think is one of my spiritual gifts. I could teach you <laughs> when to stop. Maybe like you know, six miles, six miles, three days a week, and then he comes home and then bench presses Volkswagens, and. And I thought, um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run with Matt, and I'm going to keep up as best I can 
and I'm going to go as long as I can, and I'm, but I'm going to stay behind Matt, I'm, and it's going to be great. And, and one of the great things about this is you've got all this crowd of people, right? And he's a little taller than me, he's got better vision, and he's also, he runs, I, I, I think he runs like a soccer player, because, you know, runners, runners do this, soccer players run like this, so, because uh, they... Because you got to learn to do that so that, you know, oh, oh, I didn't, I didn't elbow him. That's <laughs> just the way I run, right? So, uh, and so he's this giant wide Mack truck. Just, it's like an icebreaker. I didn't have to work. I just had to stay behind him. It's going to be fine, right? And we did this. And I was running with him, and things are going really well. A, uh, a 5K, 5 kilometers, is 3.1 miles. And so they had... Uh, the kilometer markers and the mile markers. And I got to like mile one, and I'm doing pretty good. And I've got my, my, my music in, and I'm feeling really good, and running to play that funky music, white boy, you know. It's going to be good, and I think, this is good. But I know there's going to be a time when this is not good, and I can, know, I can feel it kind of coming in, but I thought I can make it to the end of this song. It's going to be good. And then, and then the, uh, the fallout boy version of Beat It comes on, which is really amazing. I love the guitar work in it. And it's, like, and it's got that great beat. To it. I said, I could I totally do this too, even though, and I don't know what that is, what the, the muscle right here, right there in the front, hate that muscle, because that's what hurts. I'm running, and that's hurting. You know, and I'm getting, you know, I go from like, you know, two steps in, two steps out on my breathing, and I go to two steps in and one step out, which is more difficult in 4-4 four, four than I, I really imagined because I never run with music. And I thought, okay, this is, I can totally do this. And then I'm running and I'm watching Matt and I'm thinking, I need to keep up with him all the whole time. It's going to be good. Keep running. It's going to be fine. And I, I'll make it to the end of this song. And then, and then I believe in a thing called love comes on and I'm just like, I can do this too. I'll totally, I can rock this one out. I'm probably going to pass out. I could, but I could do it. And then we passed mile marker number two. I'm like, yes, this is going to be amazing. And I, and I saw us. I get a little farther, a little farther, and then I realize this is not going okay, and I'm going to break something. I tap out. Okay? I made it this far. It's like, thanks. I'm going to walk for a minute. Matt keeps going. There, the thing is, is that all along the race path, there are these people that show up, these little families. You know what they're there to do? Cheer you on. I need to figure out how I can get that assignment. <laughs> but they're there just, you know, hey, way to go. Yeah. You know, I'm kind of running right in the middle, and I think I, I need to get over there and high-five somebody. But I'm going to fall. Okay, keep running. So, you know... Keep running, keep running, keep running, and uh, I stop. These guys are cheering me on, and I you know, catch my breath, and I run for a while, and I catch my breath and run for a while, and we come back, and, and it starts off at Caper Acres and then goes, uh, goes north un- under the freeway, loops back around, and you come back under the freeway, and I'm, I'm like out of gas. I don't, you know, it's like, oh, this is, I can't walk the rest of the way. I got to run as much as I can. And we come under, and it turns uh, back, and then there's this, there's this right turn. And it's weird because the road gets narrower. But that's where we're supposed to go. Okay. And then all the people start crowding in. And then there, but there's this family there that's all cheering. And I look down, and I, you know, all of these people have been, you know, I thought, oh, that's really sweet. These guys came out to do this. That's really encouraging. That's awesome. I don't know who any of these people are. And I see this family, and they're there, and they're cheering. I don't know who they are, but they've got this handmade sign, and it said, we love you. Keep going. You can do it. It was kind of an emotional moment right there. (laughs) Somebody believes in me. I mean, I knew the sign wasn't for me, but I felt it, right? I can do this. Keep going. And like, you know... You pass that, that three-mile sign. I know there's only like a tenth of a mile left, and you, you push through because you know there's not much left. The thing about the kingdom of God and the way that God teaches us is that 
he gives illustrations that are sometimes 2,000 years old. You know, so, so we get an illustration about yeast, which to us is something that you go down and buy at the store, right? You, you get an illustration about growing things, but, but we also buy all of our stuff down at the store, right? Unless you happen to grow stuff, you don't really get a, a good feel for that. And there's a bunch of, of really amazing scripture that talks about the, the running the race of this life with Jesus, and the thing that I learned is that I have to watch who I follow because who I follow is going to take me to where I'm going. So I better know where I'm going and where the people that are going that are in front of me. And I best know how to keep going and how to make it to the end. It says that this race is not a sprint a distance run, and you ought to treat it that way. And those things that are holding you back, you need to remember those things you can let go of. I read a book this week uh, that quoted uh, Corey Tin Boom, who is a uh, she was a child in Nazi Germany uh, when when they started to exterminate the Jews, and her family hid a Jew in their own house, which was a really bad idea, except that it was a moral outrage what they were doing and they're going to stand against it. But they're going to risk everything. They were turned in by a neighbor and the whole family went to concentration camps and she's the only one that made it out. Her quote in the book was, don't hold on to anything so tight that God can't take it away from you. I kept thinking about all those verses about running a race and about getting rid of the things that hold you back and the things that slow you down. To run the race as if to win a prize. I'm not going to win a prize at running. But you know what I can do? I can work to, to get a better time next time than I did this time. Where are you at in the way that you follow Jesus today? How is it that that you are doing this? You got to know where you're going. You got to know who you're following. And when you were brought before the synagogues, rulers, and authorities, that's where they were doing the trials if you were not doing what you're supposed to do. Do not worry about how you will defend yourself or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you right there at that time what you should say. Do what you're supposed to do, let God worry about the rest, and when it comes time, God will give you the good words to say. I love that part. Really wish it said, God will make sure you know those words in plenty of time, right? It says, when you need it, they're going to be there, because your faith is public. Whether you want it to be or not, it needs to be lived out in public. The way that you live your life ought to be for God everywhere you go. It doesn't mean telling other people what to do. It means doing this yourself. So if you are a follower of Jesus today, I'm going to ask you, how public is your faith? Not in the you statements telling people what to do, but in the I statements, this is who I'm trying to be. How public are you? I'm going to ask you to pray in a moment. And if you're a follower of Jesus, I want you to pray that prayer. You might actually know all the places that you've hidden. Right? Stop it. Now, if you don't know where you're going to spend eternity, be it, I say, you know, I don't know if I'm a follower of Jesus or not. Well, that's okay, because I'm going to give you an opportunity. You can say this prayer in your heart as I say it out loud. We talked about Jesus is our Savior because I can't save myself. He's my king because I'm a part of his kingdom. And I don't say no to the king. I learn to do what he says. And he's also my friend. He'll take me with me. He'll he'll go with me and show me my world through his eyes. I'm going to pray that prayer. If you say it in your heart as I say it out loud, God will meet you right where you're at. 
Will you bow your head and close your eyes with me right now? And if you're a follower of Jesus, would you pray that prayer? How public am I? Have I outed myself? Do I live a life that exemplifies God everywhere I go? And if you're uncertain about where you'll spend eternity, you can say this prayer in your heart as I say it out loud right now. Father, I need you in my life to be my Savior because I can't save myself. Be my King. May I never tell you no. And be my friend. Show me my world through your eyes. Thank you for your gift of eternal life. It starts for me today. In Jesus' name, amen.